Hey everybody, welcome back to Feedback Loop. I'm Jeremy. I'm I'm Joey, that's me. <laughs> He's that guy. Uh, and we talk about music on this internet talk show. That's Hell what a podcast yeah. is. <laughs> no, from now on, internet talk show. Nice. Internet talk show. Yeah. We're Feedback Loop. Uh, we discover music. This week, the music we discovered isn't really a discovery by me, isn't really a discovery by Joey, so kind of a misnomer to say it's a discovery podcast but we're talking about the album sci-fi crimes by chevelle uh i picked it last week because i fucking love this album and i just wanted to wanted to listen to it because that's what i do what a reason. No reason i mean, I, mean that's I don't the best need a reason, reason. Holy yeah, i don't need to justify <laughs> we almost just said the same thing at the same time <laughs> it's because we're in sync there's some alien brain waves floating around in oh. these, these sci-fi times with these sci-fi crimes did you say aliens, man? From... Aliens, man. <laughs> Shit. Uh, <we're... laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I'm not. I'm done apologizing for us rambling at the intro of all of our episodes because it's, it's just it's it, it's fun. Yeah, it's just gonna happen. Like that's <laughs> it's just gonna happen. Uh, but yeah, I really love this album. This is my favorite Chevelle album. I like Ooh. almost all of Chevelle's albums, but this one takes the cake for me. And maybe some of that's nostalgia based. But uh, we'll, we'll we'll see how how things pan out through throughout this album. I know you had heard some Chevelle songs. You heard their big older hits yeah. like "The Red" and and "Send the Pain Below" because everyone's fucking heard those songs. It's a good song. Uh, two good songs, actually. Two, <laughs> those are two good songs, in my opinion. Uh, but again, I like all of Chevelle's music for the most part. Um, so yeah, album art uh, for this. I really like this album art too. Like. Specifically, this album, I think, is my favorite album art of theirs, which may or may not buy into this being my favorite album or not. But, uh, yeah, it's it's got, like, it's a painting, first of all, I guess. And there's, like, a tree line. There's also a forest in the background, but that's not really prominent. There's, like, a tree line, and you're right at the edge of the tree line, and on the right side, on the outside of this forest, is the, it's the side of a UFO, a flying saucer, if you will, is kind of coming in from the right side of the album. And the left side is this foresty tree line of limbless trees. It, it looks like there's just like very tall trunks with some some leaves on top, but uh, clinging to trees that you can see in this forest are some skeletons. Like like people were like either hiding from the UFO or trying to leave the forest. It's not super super clear what's going on. But there's two skeletons standing by trees in said forest. And I just I just really like the aesthetic. There's lots of like earthy browns and greens and and it's not really sepia filtered but like i don't know i i like it it's visually appealing to me yeah i like it too and i i don't know the trees and the skeleton and the ufo kind of have you ever heard of like croatoan that story about the roanoke colony that no, like it sounds familiar but I, I i would not have associated it with a story or anything that it like reminded me of that. I don't think they did that on purpose because like maybe I don't know. But it just <laughs> it just reminded me of it because it's called sci-fi crimes and people were like, "Ooh, this disappearing colony yeah. from early America. Like, what happened to them?" And <laughs> it, that's a sci-fi maybe, thing, maybe, maybe. and a crime. Yeah, maybe there were sci-fi crimes, yeah, yeah, that were committed against those people, and hopefully none of those people stayed up at night because they couldn't sleep. Because they were suffering from sleep apnea. I have a feeling that would be the least of their <laughs> problems of not trying to sleep back in. I don't want to say I keep wanting to say ancient, but nothing <laughs> about this country is ancient. So that's true. That's true. Good old ancient two hundred years ago. <laughs> uh, anyways, sleep, sleep apnea, apnea is is the introduction to this album. What did, what do you think of it, Joey? Okay, so. Let me set the scene for you whenever I first okay. listened to this album. Because I actually started listening to it a little bit later than I normally do. It was on Tuesday. I didn't start listening to it Tuesday until the next day. Usually I try to listen to it that night or at least a little bit of it. So I, I step outside because I need to clean out my car so we can go get the oil change. Like drop it off to get the oil <laughs> change. And I'm like, you know what? It's brisk. I got a sweater on. I'm outside. I can see, I can see my breath. Yeah. And uh, I put my headphones on. There's just the noise of, like, birds and shit in the background. And as soon as this comes on, I get taken back 
like immediately taken back to th- <laughs> this this album came out in 2009 right yes i got taken back to around maybe 2011 and from that point on i listened to the whole album in while i was cleaning out the car and i just stayed there it was like <laughs> i had my old honda civic back i was cleaning yeah. out that car instead and it, it was just a great feeling. That car like, was a mess. That car was always a mess. <laughs> no, I never cleaned that car out, but I was cleaning it out now, and that's what yeah. that's what mattered. It was it was a great awesome. feeling. And then immediately after, I listened to uh, White Pony, and then I listened yeah. to uh, <laughs> Saturday Night. What? Ah, oh, fuck. The other Saturday Death Night Tone. Wrist. Saturday Night Wrist. Yeah, I wanted to say Saturday yeah. Night Fights, but that wasn't right. <laughs> Saturday Night Live, yeah, the great Deftones album. <laughs> but yeah, it I was... do think I think I think Saturday Night Wrist Sidebar is my favorite Deftones album. It is an extremely good Deftones album. It is very good. It's, but, it's uh, an extremely good album. But yeah, we're not talking about that. Yeah, but yeah, it took me back, and I, I I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you, I really, really, really enjoyed this album, and I'm yeah. going to be listening to more Chevelle. I'm even gonna try their new stuff. Uh, Good. Uh, so I guess I'm gonna. I was. I was kind of saving this to the end to see where the conversation would go, but I was a little nervous that you wouldn't like this album. Uh, after me, Th- there's there's something to be said about having an album like this that that I claimed last week. I don't know if I did it on the recording or if it was after the episode, but I claimed this was one of my like top five albums of all time. Oh shit! Of all music, kind of a thing, and um, I don't. There, there's that's kind of setting myself up for failure in some ways when I'm analyzing it because I'm, I'm dissecting it. Like I've, I've said this many times when I listen to music, I don't really think about the music. I don't, or at least not like lyrically. I don't, I don't dissect music when I'm listening to it. If I enjoy something, I can't necessarily describe what I enjoy about it. And I don't think about it a lot. And so like saying like, yeah, this is my favorite album. And then having to spend an entire week dwelling on why I like the album or trying to justify it, it kind of like, it put me in a weird place where I was kind of nervous that like, maybe it doesn't hold up. Maybe there's no reason that I enjoy this. Maybe I shouldn't, or maybe I should feel bad for, for liking something like this, but I'm glad that you, you had such a a strong reaction. Yeah. And now, now I'm excited to talk about it. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And (laughs) like, no, you, you go, you go, you go. I was just, I was just gonna just push you to talk about sleep apnea. If if you have something that's more vague, then go for it as well. Um, so you had kind of described me, and I I've, I've heard them described as like having a tool type sound, but like yeah, with more of I don't want to say mainstream because, but I that has right. like a I negative, mean it's fair. I think yeah. it's fair, but like kind of a mix between that. And based on the two songs I'd heard before this, Send the Pain Below and the Red, I, I hadn't quite right. heard the tool as much. But in Sleep yeah. Apnea, I, I could hear it. like, And throughout yeah. this whole album, I could hear where the comparison comes from. Which, in my in my opinion, is a good thing. I like tool. like, mm-hmm. So I, I think I like this more than tool, is something yeah. I'll say. Uh, I'm, I'm not one of those, like, tool head people who gets like super <laughs> yeah. philosophical but whatever <laughs> that's the thing like i don't know i feel like this is probably off way too far off topic but i feel like tool fans are kind of a joke or, <laughs> yeah. or like a meme they are within meme. like a metal community and it's that's not to say that if you like tool you're wrong like tool makes good music and i know that there are a lot of rational tool fans but they they seem to end up as like the butt of a lot of jokes yeah as as within like the, the metal community i think of being like either like stoners fresh out of high school or just like younger kids that just like think it's so much more impressive yeah. than anything else and and it's true like they're they don't again don't get me wrong tool's very impressive but i it's i don't know I, I feel like there's a lot of jokes set up on tool yeah definitely there some of their fans some that i have known in my life <laughs> give off that uh kind of fake deep vibe where they're like yeah but man if you just open up the, like your mind to this and you can see all the chromosomes that we have <laughs> whatever but yeah uh but back to sleep apnea i really yeah. i really like the driving guitar riff throughout like mm-hmm. that is really what sent me back like 
it's got that nice, warm, kind of smooth tone, like still distorted, but right. it's just, it's very much a moment in time. And surprisingly, throughout this whole album, this album made me realize how much I appreciate bass in this type of yeah. music <laughs> and drums. Like, the drums Dude. on this album, I love they, it. they make me want to play drums. They make me... Play, play drums. You have an electronic drum set. Play drums. I do. And I, I I fooled around on it a little bit, but I was too busy listening to this album to do anything. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm so excited. I'm relieved. This is like... This is a high for me. Just, just <laughs> hearing that from you because, like you said, like I don't know the the guitar tones, the drums, the bass, just everything on this album. It is pretty homogenous, and and they they've kind of developed a sound f- with this album and a lot of their music. But this album specifically has such a specific sound to it, and that's where I was kind of worrying. I, I mentioned that I thought that you might not like it because it's it's borderline like offensively samey i think yeah with the guitar tone a lot of the the songs probably sound the same especially on like a first listen or just like recently discovering them like a lot of it sounds samey and that's why i was like well maybe maybe it's just like generic radio rock and it, i shouldn't love it as much as i do but i'm glad that that's i mean it still might be the case but at least we're on the same page with it being fucking yeah. awesome <laughs> i mean i i think it definitely could be samey but the thing about Samey is if you like it, then... Yeah, then I it's mean, a good thing. Yeah, and I think they do enough in each successive song to kind of keep keep interest throughout the album. Because, right. I mean, like, it's not like all the songs sound exactly the same and right. are interchangeable. They, they use the same guitar tone. Yeah. And, uh, like, they, they use a lot of, like, drop D power chords and stuff, which... Yeah. I fucking love it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a good sound. Yeah, it might be used a whole fucking lot, especially on like radio rock like this. But it's a good sound. I enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. And but, I mean, the, the last chorus gets like kind of soft. Like yeah, it, it so I was gonna it. say they 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 do change it up within each song. They pretty consistently have like pretty different bridges in the last chorus. Like there is progression that happens throughout the song. Yeah, which I think kind of may, maybe that's why. I give Chevelle a pass as far as music in the same vein as Chevelle as being Chevelle's like the better uh, choice for me. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I really like everything that we've just talked about for the whole <laughs> album. Um, and I don't want to spend like 10 hours talking about the album on the first track. Yeah. But uh, yeah, fucking one thing that we haven't talked about, which I don't know if, if you give a shit about as much, but Pete, Pete Loeffler, he's Loeffler. I don't know how to pronounce the name. Pete is the singer and guitarist for Chevelle. It's a three-person band. Uh, I fucking love his voice. Yeah. I just, his voice is just like, it might be, this is a hot take. And oh, I'm, shit. I'm probably going to regret this, I think. But I think it might be my favorite, like, male vocalist voice, like, in any band, in any genre. Like, I just, I fucking love Pete Loeffler's voice. I'm going to hold you to that, man. And I'm sure I'm going to contradict myself at some point, but I like, I don't know. I've always loved his voice and I've always like when listening to his music, when I was younger would always be like, man, that is like, that is, that's what I would want to be if I was a a musician. Yeah. is it, not really like idolizing Pete as, as a person or whatever, but like musically his voice is just like, it's perfect for me. He does a lot of melodies, which I'm obviously a big fan of melodies. We talk about that on a lot of our like dark dark pop album uh stuff that we did but uh i don't know he just his melodies his voice just all of it just like oh it's so good yeah i like the control that he has with like the distortion in his voice like he can switch yeah. so so clearly and so easily i guess but right. it's just it's nice it's very it's very good it's very good and it is very good he also uh like doesn't seem to be too upset about wavering on notes. Right. Like he can it 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 keeps that rawness, but you can tell he works at it, so like it works yeah. out. Yeah, he he I think control controls a good a good word for his, his voice. And like you said, like he, he does have a lot of melodies, like I mentioned, but yeah. it's it's a rock band. He does a lot of screaming and or yelling, I guess, maybe not screaming, but like he 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 blends the harshes with the cleans and 
it's fucking it's it's fantastic and speaking of his voice the words that are being said by his voice <laughs> is yes. what we'll talk about those, now. Th- those are called lyrics. <laughs> uh, so this song, and, you, you know, I'll just stick with this song. This song, it, <laughs> I kind of didn't, I couldn't 100% pin it down, I guess. But yep. to me, the sleep apnea was related to the anxiety you feel laying in bed at night when you're thinking about, like, something or someone, like, mm-hmm. the relating the gasping of breath or the the breathlessness of sleep apnea to the pounding in your chest the hard like it being hard to breathe whenever you're feeling extreme anxiety or like that moment where you're thinking about all the all the pains and all the hardships of your life or all your past lives anything Mm -hmm. like that and i mean it causes you to lose sleep it causes like which causes issues in the rest of your life i i just saw a parallel between those and i don't know if that has to do with just my state of mind this week or if that is a parallel that i would have drawn otherwise right. but that's what i yeah i think it's I, th- I think it's very valid uh, as an interpretation my first note for like lyrics on this album being the song I wrote, I feel like Chevelle is kind of notorious for having vague slash cryptic <laughs> lyrics that don't really mean anything, and this is not an exception. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's very much like Chevelle is, at least in my opinion, known for having those lyrics that maybe don't have a super clear meaning or intentionally are intentionally vague so that people can kind of paint them however they see it fit. Yeah. Uh, I took this song... On the surface, obviously, it's about sleep apnea, right? Yeah. But uh, I think it was, to me, I got that it was more of a reflection of maybe how he feels while he's on tour, where he's just playing concerts endlessly and never getting enough rest and and just feeling exhausted all the time. Because he mentions, like, a new test a couple times. Uh, And I was thinking, well, maybe that's, like, the a test of endurance, whether that's physical or mentally of playing show after show after show while on tour or whatever. And he mentions lighting the soul like a kiln. So I was thinking like, well, maybe he's just trying to inspire people yeah. at his concerts where he's just like, he's exhausted. He's working his ass off trying to, to get the concert goers to, to feel something to, to break out of the mundane that they, that most concert goers, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I definitely go to concerts to break out of the the f- fucking hell that is the everyday <laughs> grind. So, I appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate it, Mr. Pete Leffler. Yeah. Pete's, uh, Pete's a cool dude. Yeah. In fact, you know <laughs> yeah. what? I, I chill with him on a beach. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Wait. You, you do your thing. You do uh, your thing. I, I don't... I, I didn't have a thing, oh, but the shit. beach maybe the beach would be in Mexico, somewhere south of the border. Yeah, under the sun, that that sweet Mexican sun. <laughs> Track number two, Mexican sun. This one it starts off with the drums counting in, and then there's like this ascending guitar riff that kind of like builds some sort of like uh, stress. There's a word I'm looking for that I didn't that I can't think of, but it's suspense, I guess, in a way. There you and, go. Pete, Pete comes in and just like he screams a bit more in this one. His melodies are fantastic. I, I, that can be said for every track on this album, so I'm going to try not to say that. Uh, this one has some ride cymbal in it. That is the first time that I that I call out the drums specifically, but I do love the drums on this album. Yeah, the drummer is Sam Luffler, who's Pete's brother. He's a Whoa. fantastic drummer. I, I really enjoy their drums on all of their albums. He's like kind of an inspiration for me as a drummer, I guess, in that he keeps it simple. A lot of the times, but there's just something about it that's like he has his own style of simple, and I think it works very well with the the kind of simple chord progressions or the simple drop D power chord kind of feel of of this rock style. Um, but yeah, I, I like the song. Yeah, I definitely see that about the drums. Like that's something that I noticed, and I think that might have been why I picked up on the drums so much on this album. Like it made me want to play them. Like he kind of writes it in a style that seems attainable. Like, you could play it yourself, but you know there's more going into it than... It's kind of like the stuff where you hear something and you're like, ah, why didn't I think of that? Or I could have thought of that. But in (laughs) reality, you know you couldn't have. But it's just that you know that if you try... It seems so obvious. Yeah, like you could... 
if you just put in a little effort, you could play it, but you probably couldn't come up with it, I guess. Right. Yeah. But I, I think that's, that's very valid. I, yeah, I like it. I like the guitar tone. That's, I'm going to say that on everyone just because I like, <laughs> but I, I like this album slowly made me realize, I think I like the guitar tone so much because it has the backup of the bass behind yeah. it. Like just the way the bass is played behind the guitar makes the tone super warm, super smooth, super thick. And this one, right. speaking of bridges back to the first song, like really good bridges. I almost like, like the bridge from the bridge on more than the rest of the song, just because like, it's such a yeah. refreshing change in this song. Like, cause I mean, like you said, there's like the, I guess, suspenseful guitar, but the, the relief comes in that second half in the bridge where it's just, right. I, it sounds more, I guess, my style in, in the second I, half. I think that is, that is also part of why I was kind of like, when I was dwelling on this album and if I even really liked it kind of a thing <laughs> over this past week that I've been kind of grueling over, that's the one thing that kept, that I kept coming back to is like, man, like every, in every song where they have a bridge, what I think is most, if not all the songs on this album, yeah. their bridges come in and just, they, they saved me from that of like, Oh, well, it's just the same sound over and over again because their bridges, I don't know. I don't know how they do it or what specifically about the bridges on this album or their music in general, but like their bridges always sound fucking great. And it always distances itself just enough from the rest of the song to stand out, which obviously is what a bridge is supposed to do. Yeah. It's, it's supposed to be like a B section, but the way they do it, it's just, I don't know. It's masterful. Yeah. I, I agree. Like, I mean, I guess I never really thought too much about why it's called a bridge, but I guess it's just supposed to be the thing that can kind of hold, hold you throughout the mid mid to like later section of the song to bridge right. between maybe like the second and last chorus or something, but they yeah. almost take it and turn it into what could be a completely separate song on its own that would stand really well on its own. Right. Yeah. They, that, that's another thing that we've kind of danced around, but I don't think we've explicitly said yet is that they have a lot of really good riffs. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it's, it's mostly pretty simple stuff. It, it's again, kind of like what you're saying about the drums where it's like, Oh yeah, I could have written that. But you, but you didn't, and it, it it takes. It's more than just being able to play it; it's yeah. being able to to create it, yeah, and and invent it. And they're just like they're very simple riffs for the most part, but they sound so fucking good, so fucking good. <laughs> and, and speaking of so fucking good, uh, nothing because I couldn't think <laughs> of, <laughs> I couldn't like fully think of what the song was supposed to mean, and had like like you said, they seem to be really good at. Right, like he, I guess Pete, he writes the lyrics. I would yeah. imagine. Uh, yes, I believe so. He seems to be pretty good at writing, like pretty vague lyrics. Which uh, yeah. this week, what, the way I was feeling, I think, in I think it really played a huge part in how I uh, interpreted a lot of the songs. But what mm -hmm. I got from it was like the longing to feel normal again, kind of like. The longing to feel something other than like a bad feeling, like wanting, he talks about wanting to feel the sun on his arms and like, right. but he not only describes like the warmth of it, but like if, even if it damages his, like, yeah. l like, I don't know, like t wanting to feel something that you know is good and take it with the bad rather than just feel the bad, I guess is a summation. Yeah. I like that. Cause he, I mean, he's because he's talking about getting a tan. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's <laughs> the Mexican son. He's he's lying on a beach somewhere getting a tan, right? And he says, uh, "The chorus is like to be feeling the sand bring color back to both my arms. The sun, let it do damage like they said it would if given chance." Which is it's poetic in in a lot of ways, where it's kind of like it's taking something very simple like getting a tan and making it a little bit more flowy and and, and verb like yeah. using a lot of language to say that. I guess, which is something that I think ties into him being vague is that he, he kind of runs with the, the poetic kind of aspect without it, without thinking about like 
necessarily a logical flow to things but uh yeah was for, for my notes lyrically i put again i have no clue what he's singing about and i really <laughs> don't care <laughs> so i was kind of on the same page uh i said the chorus seems to be just about him wanting to go back to the mexico and sit in the sun and get tan but there's also like a lot of weird shit in this song that goes on that has nothing to do with that at all yeah like, um, what's up with the cat and the tail <laughs> <laughs> yeah like that's a, so that's another thing i feel like i don't know if this is just me being like con- g- giving into confirmation bias, but I feel like a lot of the lyrics listed on Genius are not what I've heard for yeah. the years that I've listened to this album. And this one, specifically, like at the the end of the last chorus, uh, Genius has "Hey, way to go, lad," <laughs> but I always I always heard it as "Can't wait to go back." Like he he's wanting to go back to Mexico and to to get to that happy place, but. I have complaints about that throughout all of my notes pretty much throughout this. It's just that, like, I don't know if I can't hear or if whoever transcribed the lyrics for Genius took them the wrong way or or what's going on there. But there, there were several moments this week where I was like, that is not what I've heard at all. And I still can't hear it the way that Genius has it listed. So, What if in his attempt to be super vague about his lyrics. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Pete Leffler, like, researched... He's a fucking genius. Like, he researched sounds that have, like, similar cadences, like, words. Right. So he just uses a lot of those to leave stuff completely up to interpretation. Like, even the words aren't set in stone. <laughs> it's just however right. you hear it. Yeah, that's... and that's, like, even, even on Genius, like, I'm looking at it right now... The last line, they have it say, hey, way to go. But in parentheses, it says, can't wait to go. I so, think like, you, I don't know, I I don't know if right. they're I don't know if they're disagreeing with themselves or if this this was just like, I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense to me saying, I mean, hey, way to go, lad. I think you're probably right. And somebody just doesn't know what they're typing. It's weird. They, but, they should be ashamed. Yeah. Of, fact, of the way that they're transcribing those metaphors. Yeah. In fact, if I was Mr. Pete Leffler. I would uh, be writing my words using some shameful metaphors to describe <laughs> these people. Joey, I, I'm going to cut the bullshit because uh, this is my favorite Chevelle song of all time. Dude, Sham- dude! Shameful metaphors. Oh my god! This, this song is, like, I was thinking about it, I was writing my notes over the weekend, and I think it was last week, um, some people in my Discord server were talking about a, a question that I generally pass off as a stupid question. Uh, and the question was, uh, if you could only listen to one song for the rest of your life, what song would it be? And I generally don't like answering those things because A, it's never going to happen, and B, there's, it's, it's way too nebulous of an idea to, to reduce all of the music you want to listen to into one song. Yeah. But as I was writing my notes, I was thinking about it. I was like, this song, I think I could listen to this song literally forever and never get tired of it. Hell yeah. Tell me you feel the same. I don't know if it's my favorite song ever, but it's 100% <laughs> my favorite song on the album. That's all, Possib- that's all I wanted. Possibly my favorite Chevelle song. I, it's my favorite Chevelle song I've ever heard, so we'll Fuck go with yeah. that. <laughs> but it's yeah, this so good. It's 100%. From the moment, not I guess not from the moment it started, but like 30 seconds in, I knew. I was like, mm-hmm. this is going to be my favorite song on the album. Like, right. Just the, the way <laughs> the guitar sounds going into it like how it's a little bit lighter than it's not yeah. the full distortion it's just like that lighter kind of warm i described it as the whole song as like a warm rain kind of coming in yeah on the intro i, I on, feel that 100 percent. like it's just you're laying there and you're just like oh this is nice this is so good let it soak let it wash over me it's i love I that yeah uh, it's i think i think that's a perfect description honestly hell yeah Hell yeah. if, if you if you haven't if you didn't listen to this album but you're listening to this episode, uh, go listen to the song at the very least because it's fucking. It, also, there's a live performance I think, and that's that's kind of a, a side note. I've seen Chevelle I think three times live, and every time I've seen them, they just they fucking kill it. They kill their live shows too, which is totally un, well not totally unrelated to what we're talking about. But but this song, go look it up. Look up the live version as well. It's it's fucking beautiful. Absolutely beautiful because this song is what like cemented i whenever i was washing my car this is what like i had to stop for a second whenever this song came on i was just like sitting in the back seat and i was just like oh fuck like (laughs) i I, 
I don't know something about it. And I don't know if this is like nostalgia for the sound or whatever, yeah. but like something about it took me back. It made me, it had like a tangible effect on me. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I've been fighting with something this past like two weeks, maybe. And this song, mm -hmm. like it, like cut to the core of it, I guess. Yeah. And then I don't know. From it's that just point, like, like, it, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think what does it for me is like, like you said, it, it has that kind of like lightly distorted. It's, it's a much lighter kind of guitar tone for a lot of it. And then the chorus comes in. And it's still just as punchy as the rest of the album. And I think what does it for me specifically in the song, again, is Pete's voice. Just the way he sings and how his voice sounds and how he expresses the words and, and delivers every line. It's just like, it's fun to sing along to. It's it, it just feels good. It's got a good groove to it. Just like, I don't know. The, the song, I've, I've gushed enough about it, but like the groove of the song with the drums, the guitars, it's just impossible for me not to like sway to or, or, or to bob to. Uh, I love drumming to the song. It's just like every aspect it's just so like it's i i think i keep thinking back to the, the warm rain comparison because I, I think it's perfect it's just, it's such a like calming and like flowing sensation of listening to the song and i i think a lot of that is is due to pete's voice at least for me for sure like the way he sings now i sound like we're we're both just like fangirling over, over this <laughs> I mean, we are, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> but, like, so the way he sings it is, like, if his voice falters just enough mm -hmm. to let you know that he's, like, which is, this is gonna sound weird, considering how much we've talked about how vague his words are, but, like, right. that he's, he's focusing on, like, whatever meaning he's saying. Like, he's focusing more on the words rather than, like, how he's actually singing. But right. it almost gives him, like, a human quality not to sound like he's above human or something, but like, right. it's nice to hear a singer sing in a way that reminds you that like, this is a person who is singing, who is producing this music for me to then enjoy. And it just gives right. it like an added element to it. Cause not saying like his voice is bad or it cracks at any point, but it like, you can hear the human element to his voice really well in the song, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, I agree that maybe saying that it cracks is, is not right, but I think faltering is a good description where yeah. where he he doesn't necessarily fall flat of what he's intending, but it yeah there's there's some there's a specific quality about it that is very much not super polished. It's not it's intentionally not like it it almost seems maybe as if it's like a one take kind of situation. Yeah, where he had the lyrics, he had the melody to set his mind, and he's just like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna go with it. I want to get these words across, and however it comes out, it comes out." Yeah, kind of like thing. I think it's a stylistic choice for sure. Like what, right. like the way he's singing, because it's by no means like the rawness that you'd hear in like if you went to go see your local punk band or something. <laughs> yeah, but, but like, uh, yeah, it's just not the produced voice with like tons of layers behind it or whatever tons of like you can tell they did like a bunch of different takes of him singing harmonies to make it sound fuller it's like it has a very real quality to it yeah uh ironically i think lyrically the song is about not being heard or not being understood which is kind of ironic to me because we've we've talked so much about how we don't know what the fuck he's saying <laughs> in these songs but it, it seemed like he's frustrated that he's repeating himself over and over again and trying so hard to get a point across and nobody's listening or understanding what he's trying to say. I think this could also maybe be taken in like a, an anti-government, anti-political kind of way where he might be talking about how people voice their opinions and yet no change is made to reflect that in the system. Yeah. Uh, specifically the second verse he sings, revolting man, the sacred chain brought down to trial. No better man could fail the way. You needed all keep close the vein of empty thoughts, which kind of makes me think that like when pressured about this, the man is just like trying to sedate people and keep them calm with these empty thoughts, just kind of like fill their head with, with bullshit to, to sedate them or keep them under control kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I mean, the, 
I could see that through the bridge, behold the loss, behold a band-aid, like, is the words there, which, when given that context, could make me think, behold the lost, as in talking to the people, and the man mm -hmm. is presenting a band-aid, a cover, to just, like, be like, I don't care what your problems are, here's just a blanket fix to it, right. like, I'm not actually listening to what you're saying, and I feel like the chorus at least the opening line of the chorus, so why has all my life made no sound? It it hits harder coming from a person who makes music for a living. Like it Yeah. It uh it hit me in a way that was like talking about it made me think about my own life, I guess, and the think impact of, that you have or haven't had. Yeah, exactly. Like is the thing that I have chosen to make my life worth i guess is that impactful in any way or like whatever i'm doing that is supposed to be giving my life purpose is that giving any sort of purpose is that is that making a sound like right it's, it's me sitting behind a desk typing away doing whatever the fuck i'm doing getting yeah. paid for uh, like is what is that doing is that that's that's not making a sound is that I, I don't know it was maybe it was too deep but that's that's where I, it went yeah, I mean, I think I also was in a similar mindset this this past week, and actually, like last night specifically, uh, we're recording this on Tuesday. I postponed last night because I, I wasn't feeling up to recording this episode last night. But instead, I I watched uh, the movie Joker, the twenty nineteen Joker movie last night, and kind of had a fucking crisis afterward. Oh shit! It's, it, it's it's very much along the same the same veins as what you were saying. And I'm not. I'm not saying that I'm depressed or like or struggling yeah. with that stuff. But I mean, you, you have those days. Yeah. And and you kind of have to stop and think like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Like this isn't what I want. This isn't like, this isn't the impact. This isn't the sound that I want my life to make. And I it just like it make it kind of makes you want like freak out. It makes me freak out a bit. And I kind of have the not really a panic attack or anxiety attack attack or anything like that, but. I, I definitely, like, I had to stop. I had to go, like, take a shower. I stayed up till, like, 4 o'clock in the morning. And I was just like, man, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's it's not working, yeah. whatever it is, kind of a thing. Uh, I'm, I'm better now. It, these these things come and go. But, uh, yeah, that I definitely relate to having that kind of mentality over the past week yeah. uh, and listening to the song and album and kind of getting that. That's... Was that too deep? Was, no. that, was that too deep to dig us out? That is the literal pain <laughs> of consciousness that we are forced to deal with <laughs> in a society that has made us choose between following what we want to do or following what we have to do to survive, I guess. is yeah. That's that's how I compartmentalize it whenever I start thinking that. I'm like, I have a child to feed. I, I there's, <laughs> that, that may be some, I can glean purpose from that like me right the thing that i'm doing i can i can push it off i can push off the meaning it's like no my meaning isn't doing unnamed desk job that is not my meaning right my it's meaning, providing for your family yeah like but in reality there's the part of me that knows that you're not satisfied that i'm not satisfied because that's that's what i'm spending half of my waking hours do, doing yeah it's it's a very <laughs> real conundrum and i think there are people that i think they're fine with that with their job not being a point of passion in their life because they find their passion elsewhere and that's what everyone tells you right it's like well yeah. you don't have to love your job but you, you need to find something outside of your job to to focus on to to make the the shitty job worth it and it's just a lot of times it's hard to to justify that yeah especially like i mean honestly like dream job for me is either like software development making video games or as a musician or in some something to do with making music whether that's like video game soundtracks or if that's like doing something like chevelle or something like like just releasing music for a living like yeah. that'd be ideal for me and every minute that i'm not doing that is like it kind of puts a damper on it because it's like well like i'm just sitting here at a desk like you said doing the same shit over and over again and it's not really having an impact but I'm also like drained from doing that in such a way that I don't feel like putting a lot of effort into music, especially with the way I think music is talked about or becoming a rock star or yeah. a, a, the famous, like it's, it's not something that seems achievable or, or realistic. And it, it, it like, I don't know. It seems so much based 
on luck or who you know or whatever, but I, I think that's bullshit, and I think that I I personally need to get over that and just fucking dedicate myself to making music or to making steps to, to become a, a developer kind of yeah. a thing and, and sell myself on it. I mean, I think that's the thing, and I'll... I'll uh, yeah okay so i think that's the thing like in this current day and age you can there's mo so many avenues and i feel like i don't know if this is intentional or not but i feel like it's a way to keep other people out mm -hmm. of keeping that rock star mentality or like this is the way that you're gonna you, you have your one big break and you're gonna make it and you're gonna go huge and you're gonna play right. arenas all over the country when in reality you can realize your dream in so many different ways. Like, you mentioned video game soundtracks. Yeah. How many... Th there are very few video game soundtrack artists that are fucking rock stars, but there's so right. many that all of them are living their dream. Every yeah. single one of them is living their dream. Jeremy Soule, Chris... I can't pronounce his last name from Risk Chris, of Rain Soundtrack. Chris, Chris Dottolu, I think. Chris Dottolu, that's... Okay. Something, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Like, those people... They're, they're doing great work out there. And yeah. the guy who made Shovel Knight, I can't think of his name, but he did a great fucking soundtrack. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's, like, people, I feel like people put too much thought past that, where they're like, ah, that's just something somebody at the development company does. But it's like, that's, right. that's somebody's job who went yeah, out there. it's their passion. Yeah, and they sold themselves on it. And they, like like you said, they, they got out there and they just fucking devoted some a lot of time to it and they're like hey i'm good at this now i'm i'm not a rock star but i am making a a real actual living off of doing this this isn't my side job this is my job now right and they're not drained at the end of the day oh of... good for them yeah exactly that's awesome that's super awesome <laughs> i'm i'm jealous but good for them <laughs> but like it's it's attainable because yes. there's all the people who you i don't know their names but like I play a lot of video games. Right now I'm only playing one video game, and it's Skyrim. But usually I play a lot of video games. <laughs> right. And uh, all of those games had to have somebody make their soundtracks. All the TV shows that I watch had to have somebody curate the sound for them. All the movies that I watch had to have somebody make a soundtrack for them. There's, yeah. there's, there's so many more opportunities than just being the typical rock, rock star. star. Right. Oh my was, god. That was, no, <laughs> I'm not apologizing for that. <laughs> And I don't, I don't think we should. That was yeah. a good conversation, and I'm glad we had that. Yeah. But we're doing, a, we're doing a podcast. We're gonna get back to the Chevelle album. Uh, I'll probably cut that. That I'm not gonna cut it out of this yeah. episode. This is gonna be a long episode, and I'm not sorry for it because I think that that conversation needed to happen. Yeah. But uh, track, track number four, jars. Jars. It's uh, oh my god. So this... <laughs> let's, let's bring it back down. <laughs> take take a chill pill. Bring it back down. Jars. I think this was the the lead single yeah. for this album. I was kind of surprised because I mentioned it last week to you. I think after we were done recording that you'd probably heard Jars, and you said that you hadn't heard it, which kind of surprised me because I feel like this was a pretty big hit. I think I might have, and I just didn't immediately recognize it because the more I listened to it, the more I was yeah. like, ah, oh, this sounds really familiar, actually. So I think I've heard it. Like the chorus sounds very familiar. Yeah, you probably heard it in passing or on a commercial or something. Yeah, at some point. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think it did get a bit overplayed. Uh, coming from my music world, it it got a bit overplayed. I think on the radio and, and whatnot. But I still like it, and I I really like the melody of the chorus. Uh, just like I don't know, the, the the delivery again from Pete of the chorus is is fun. It's fun to sing even if you don't really know what you're singing. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of ghost notes on the snare in this that stood out to me that Hell kind of feel yeah. good. Uh, and a lot of layers of guitars and, and effects and stuff in the, in the pre-chorus that kind of give it a, a larger or spacier kind of vibe that uh, I really enjoy. Yeah, the way he was playing the drums on here, yeah, I guess it was ghost notes, like, because there were parts where I couldn't tell if it was, I was hearing the bass strings, like, click from him plucking <laughs> right. the bass, or if it was him hitting, like, ghost notes or, like, the rim or something. Mm -hmm. on like the snare and but it was it just it, yeah it definitely added a really cool element to the background of it and it was stuff like that that started to really like i was just like man maybe i don't want to play guitar maybe i want to play bass maybe i want to play drum. <laughs> play it all man yeah just, i'll just be a be a single like be a one-man band 
all at the same time too. I'll learn how to play guitar with my hands, bass with my feet. <laughs> I'll hit a drum with my head or something. I don't know. I mean, you can you can do like a simple like kick and snare pedal kind of deal going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, there we go. But, but yeah, pretty good, pretty good song. I think everyone has has heard the song at some point. That's obviously a, a huge sweeping generalization. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it, it doesn't really stand out uh, amongst this album. I think again, it's it's the lead single. It kind of captures everything that we've we've said about Chevelle at this point. Uh, lyrically, this is the first one that I think captures that sci-fi motif, uh, at least from my interpretation. And I feel like this song is kind of a story about how the world is doomed, potentially relating to shameful metaphors uh, about like the men just like keeping people down or whatever. But uh, it, se- it seems like the world is doomed to die, and so to preserve what we can or, or what they can in this hypothetical world. They put specimens from earth and into jars and either use them as display or demonstration or education tools for future generations after earth has been destroyed or potentially as a way to, to give earth a second life, like to, to take samples and make a new earth kind of a thing from that on a different planet at another time. But either way, I, I think the general idea of it is preserving what good we have on the planet yeah i i got that as well like i didn't know if it was aliens saving us in jars or if it was scientists saving us in jars or yeah what but it was as a result of our own hubris but uh i also gleaned another meaning of this song and i don't know why because reading the lyrics now it doesn't make much sense but I saw the jars as people compartmentalizing their emotions to succeed in a world that wasn't wasn't fit for humans. Like kind of the way that our society has progressed just seems very counterintuitive to what I feel like the human nature is. Mm-hmm. And it forces people to put parts of themselves into jars to keep them out of sight. And the aftermath and the repercussions of everybody doing that and that's kind of what leads to this end time event or just like people's um, like relationships unraveling because the jar- they can't hold all these jars type type of deal i guess right but i don't yeah, know it's how- true i mean jars like i i took the jars in like a preservation way which i mean you, you also picked up on a bit yeah but uh it, it's also kind of interesting to think like jars you, when you think of a jar you think of a glass jar right and glass is notoriously kind of fragile so like it, it's definitely possible like you're bottling up things like that and just waiting for it to break or, or you're juggling all these things that you've bottled up and eventually you're going to drop a, a jar and it's going to shatter and that's going to have kind of an outward effect oh man you know yeah, it would really suck if those jars fell into your shoes, though. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, Joey. <laughs> caught me off guard with that one, the left hook, right into track number five. <laughs> oh, man, that fucking got me. <laughs> track... <laughs> fell into your shoes is track number five. <laughs> Whew. I don't, I, I can't even, my brain was just not expecting that at all. Uh, this one has a lot of suspense built. Yeah. in the beginning of the song and throughout the song there's like the, these sounds of like what reminded me of like a suspension bridge the wires being like stretched and snapping about to break kind of kind of a deal which they get from like obviously using their guitar they do like pick slides and then stuff like that but it kind of like it builds the suspense like something's about to snap and then just as as that sinks in that like there's some suspense building the song just starts it, it's a pretty abrupt start the drums come in, the guitar comes in, everything just kind of kicks off. He starts singing immediately after that kind of suspense is built. Um, they do something that I noticed more on this song than in a lot of the other ones, but I'm sure it's kind of scattered throughout, where they have like a very fast-picked, uh, high-pitched guitar notes kind of going on in the background, giving some cool like ambient noise yeah. fe- feeling like kind of buried a bit underneath the main guitar riffs and stuff. But I, I really like that, especially like... It kind of kind of makes me get more in, into the sci-fi mindset because it feels kind of like alien or or distant and spacey kind of in, in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I noticed that more on this song than a lot of the other ones. 
Yeah, they definitely did a lot. Like, they put a lot more atmosphere into the song. Like, with, yeah, that high tremolo, like, picking guitar yes. and the metallic sounds in the background. It, it kind of gave it, like, an eerie type feeling. Kind of like you're watching The Twilight Zone or something. But yeah. uh, it was, yeah, it was just a really nice, nice sound. Uh, I felt like the drums were at the forefront here mm-hmm. as well throughout. And I don't know. I don't know if this is just me picking up on the like picking up on the drums. I guess it's the album. Like they just did a good job of like showcasing the drums. Or since it's yeah. a three person band, maybe that's just how <laughs> how the mixing works. But that, that I mean, yeah, I think they, they do a good job throughout most of their discography of, of kind of accenting Sam's drumming abilities. Like I, I they definitely don't mix the drums out or, or down where a lot of uh less less chevelle bands i guess <laughs> in, bands in the same vein tend to kind of probably push drums a bit further to the back where they're not as prominent but yeah there's there's a lot like you said they're very prominent in the song i think they're very prominent in a lot of chevelle music in general and i think that's a factor of why i like chevelle because i mentioned that i i enjoy drumming to a lot of their songs um and i i think part of that is because it's so easy to pick up on what is actually being played on the drums kind of a thing and it's not really buried yeah, there's also a guitar solo in this that I, I really like. It, it's got a lot of needlies, the yeah. tremolos and, and Hell such yeah. a guitar solo. The squeedly needlies. The squeedly needlies. I really enjoy it. I Yeah, the end, of, like, the outro, too. Like, just the tone that they had in the outro on the guitar, that super fuzzy yeah. type of tone. It's just, an, it's a nice sound. Uh, as for, like, lyrics, this one, it's it was pretty vague to me. But mm-hmm. something about it gave me the vibe that it was like a child-parent relationship, and each one of them is just kind of fumbling around, like trying to understand each other. And the "fell into your shoes" line is more about like whenever you accidentally stumble, you have that moment of clarity where you realize the other person's perspective, and right. that kind of happens between, like, as a child grows up, the parent can it they kind of go from like a parent to like, Oh shit. I remember whenever I was this age or like, cause right. they always say it, but then like you have a, you're so far detached from that. I'm so yeah. far. Like you don't I, know what it's like to be your daughter right now. Yeah, exactly. And I won't in eight years or 10 years. I don't know what math, right. like <laughs> eventually whenever she's in a teenager or whatever, like I'm not going to, I'm going to be like 40 at that point and (laughs) just going to be so far gone from it. I'm going to have been her parent for so long that I will have forgotten and I'll have a moment of clarity and the respect of like becoming a parent. It is made me have that moment with my parents where I went through Mm -hmm. stuff where it was like, I thought back to whenever I was a kid and how I reacted, how like my daughter is reacting and right. how how my parents reacted to me acting that way and it's like oh fuck like i'm taking a step <laughs> into their shoes and it, it's just happenstance at this point but i i really like that interpretation of the song i like that so much more than what i got <laughs> <laughs> uh because I, I don't know that, that that was kind of a nice like real realism like heartwarming almost uh interpretation but for me i i kind of ran with the themes of corruption that uh, kind of established in the last one where it i i also picked up on uh kind of that dichotomy but i thought it was of how more quote-unquote senior members of society are just throwing younger people at the problems and, and yeah. writing them off as casualties as, as they're failing or whatever where they're like trying to find solutions like rats in a lab just just like the older people are watching the younger people trying to navigate all of the issues that maybe the older people created hmm, maybe but, uh, <laughs> learn and learning from them and then keeping the knowledge that they're learning to themselves until to tie it back to like the whole sci-fi into the world thing they're so they're learning from the lab rats of the younger people and then keeping that knowledge that they're learning to themselves until the day that the world is ending and then selling those secrets back to the, the people that uh, they use to discover said secrets there was something specific uh yeah in the bridge that made me think that where he says closing chapters tell of a final virtue, which kind of like an impending doom kind of thing to me. Um, but he says pay for healing as eyes go hollow. So that kind of like makes me think that like you're paying 
for a cure or paying for a solution to something that is going wrong in the world. So a as the world's ending, all the people that get compiled all of this knowledge are just like, no, like, fuck you, you can pay me for it if you, if you want to stay alive kind of a thing. Otherwise, you're just going to disappear into the nothing. That would 100% happen, and I'm... I'm calling it. That's gonna happen at the end of the world. <laughs> There's gonna yeah. be a bunch of people that knew the whole solution the whole time. They're like, "Oh, in the thirteenth hour, we will sell you this <laughs> right. this solution." Yup, because that's the that's how big big pharma works. <laughs> so anybody who has a big before their name, that's how they work. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's how you make money by manipulating other people and fucking them over. But Bezos. That, Fucking I Bezos. chose your name out of a hat because you, you didn't need to. Fuck yeah. Bezos. <laughs> Guy has more money than God. God more money than no me. Money. I have more oh. money than God. God has no money. He doesn't need money. Or, or does God have all of the money, Joey? I guess that's true. I guess nobody could have more money because if you go if you're going by the belief that God made everything, I guess He made all the money. So technically, all the money's His. Yeah. So I mean, or He made the people that made the money. If you're that's, going around about way, but yes, yeah. it's true. It's all his. Maybe you should write him a letter. I after will. You, after you steal some of his money. <laughs> oh, I thought you were about to be accusing God of a, of a thiefing, being a thief. I mean, so. well, then he would be writing you a letter, and I don't. I don't. I think that's that's too menial for God. God doesn't write letters. That's true. He just talks in my brain, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> track number six, <laughs> letter from a thief. I'm pretty sure this was also another big single. It had to have been because I've I've heard this song. I feel okay. like. In the heart, in my heart of hearts, I feel like I've heard this. Song. <laughs> yeah, and it has a fancy single cover, so it was definitely released as a single. I think this was like the second single. Maybe it was, maybe it was before Jars, and I just have a warped perception of time, which is very possible. Uh, I really love the chorus in this song, and at this point, I noted that a lot of the album was kind of using the same sound but in different ways. Yeah. And again, I I don't think it's an issue because it's a good sound, and I really like the sound of it. Yeah, this one has a guitar solo too, also. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty fucking cool. Hell yeah, it is. It's got that super fuzzy tone that I liked from uh from what was that, Jars? I believe it was Jars. The... From all of the songs. <laughs> well, it's like an extra fuzzy. Right. But uh yeah, it's it's just a nice sound that they had through the guitar solo. And um I don't know. Like his voice on this song, it kinda I'm trying to think of a way without directly comparing him to Tool, because, <laughs> but I think it was, I don't think it's so much of his voice as the way he sings. Mm -hmm. Not like, because I do, I love this chorus. Like this chorus is fucking awesome, and I will right. sing, I will sing along to it all day long. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, I, my voice. <laughs> my voice was going out we we got so passionate and and talked so much that the we're all that our throats are getting tired because we don't talk to people in our day-to-day -day. for real man like <laughs> that's that's a huge issue that like i had a job interview the other day and i straight up told him i was like i haven't talked to anybody in a real setting other than i mean i wasn't like plugging the podcast in my job interview <laughs> but I was like, you should <laughs> Hey everybody! Yeah, it was hey. like, you, you panel of people, five people asking me <laughs> questions. Listen to feedback, please. Yeah, fucking do it. So I don't have to take this job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I like it's. I don't know. It's just an issue with not having to talk to people. My voice yeah. is not trained anymore. But yeah, I, I like the energy in the song. I I don't know where I've heard it from because I don't think I heard it from the radio. I don't know if I heard it from. Do you have this song on Rock Band, perhaps? I, I don't believe so. Okay, because that was one of the options. But yeah, I I just I like it. That was a really long way of saying that I like this song. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a pretty cool song. Uh, lyrically, I, this is another one that I, I doubted the lyrics on uh, because at the beginning the, he starts the song off by kind of like not really whispering, but he kind of he kind of like spits or speaks the words uh they know what everybody knows better sit a letter from a thief says and i always heard that as better said a letter from a thief says like he's like well in a better way of saying what i just said a letter from a thief says and so better sit because i don't think that made sense to me and then in um 
the chorus, they wrote defend it off and fool them all. But I always heard to fend it off instead of defend, which I mean, I guess it's, it's a similar enough meaning that it's a moot point, but it's just kind of weird to, to yeah. see lyrics descri- or transcribed as something other than what I've always known them as. I also heard to fend it off and was surprised when I read to fend it off. Yeah. Uh, but genius in this case, because I, I go to genius for my lyrics as well. Uh, yeah. This is the one song that they ha- like had a, I guess, an about section for where like usually they'll be like, this is what the artist said or this is what it's mm-hmm. commonly held. And I, I saw that out of the corner of my eye and just read it and it ruined all objectivity for me. <laughs> so I, I yeah. couldn't extrapolate like any sort of deeper meaning from the song because I felt like I was like, oh, well, this is what it's about. But it seemed to be about, uh, I guess the band got their gear stolen after a show and they recovered some of it. And mm. I guess like the, the guy who stole the stuff returned Pete Leffler's guitar because right. he like recognized or found out that that was his guitar. So he returned it out of the goodness of his heart. <laughs> Yeah, but see that that doesn't make sense to me because why wouldn't he just return all the gear? Like, yeah, was, yeah, like just had. So I I don't know. I think the the snippet that they wrote on Genius is not detailed enough to make those kind of uh, draw draw a good conclusion from. Uh, but I also read that, and that's a super shitty thing to do. First of all, don't yeah. do that. But but to to me, I I still kind of try to draw somewhat of my own conclusion. But it kind of ties back. Uh, I, I put that it's, it seemed like he's saying someone is so insignificant that if he stops thinking about them, they cease to exist, and and maybe feeling some sort of burden associated with that. But the music is a lot less like aggressive or angry, yeah. so I'm not really sure if that's an accurate kind of a thing. But because of course he says, if you ever enter my life, or if you ever enter my mind, stay there, you'll live kind of thing, which to me, I, I took that to mean like, if I stop thinking about you, you die. You don't yeah. exist anymore kind of a thing, which is, it, it makes sense as in, it, that I feel like it's kind of a shitty thing to say, but like as a celebrity talking to somebody that, that's a nobody relatively, so I'm like, oh no, you only exist in my mind. If I say you exist, you exist because no one else is going to know who you are otherwise kind of a thing. Which, yeah doesn't strike me as something that Pete would say, so I, I hope I'm wrong about that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. That, that's that's the only interpretation that I can pull aside from what was written on Genius. Well, that's more than I got, because after that, every time I tried to think of something, I'd be like, ah, oh, no, he's just writing this to some dude who pissed him off because he stole all of his fucking gear <laughs> right. out of a tour bus. <laughs> Which, Which is... would suck. Absolutely, it would suck. Yeah. You're all, you're gone from home for months out of the year, playing shows every night, and it- yeah, especially like your main guitar. Like like Pete is obviously the front man of the band, but he he uses that that red guitar and pretty much everything that I've ever seen. He he's playing that guitar, and so like he's been through some shit with that guitar, and and I'm glad it was returned to him. But it's like I can't imagine that feels good to just have that snatched from you. Just like right, right out from under you. Just like your guitar's gone. But uh, if if he ever stops thinking about the guy and he dies, then maybe he's gonna be a ghost, some sort of some some sort of ghostly apparition that might come haunt Pete uh, in Scotland, in, in, in the Highlands somewhere. <laughs> so we can talk about track number seven, which is Highlands Apparition. Boom. Which is my second favorite track on this album. Hey, me too. Because yeah. it's like such a change of pace at this point in the album. It's an acoustic song. It's just yeah. acoustic Pete singing. It's, yeah, it's this is nice. one of the, the first songs that I taught myself how to play on guitar as well. It's a very nice so song. It's kind of kind of got a nice nice place in my heart for that. But yeah, it's, it's it, the stripped down nature of it being an acoustic track really allows Pete's vocals to take the, the focus. But uh, I think the, the guitar tone that they get from the acoustic is very good at supporting his melodies and, and the riffs that they, they play on it are just 10 out of 10. I like it. Yeah. Also, uh, this this is the first song. I probably could have mentioned it at a few other points on this album, but he does this howl thing in, in the bridge when he leads into it where he goes, howl! And it's, it's like, 
it's so beautiful <laughs> and i think he knows it and i feel like so much of chevelle's music is based on him knowing how to use his voice to get very specific like emotions and, and, and feels and just like he he knows it sounds good yeah and so they they sprinkle it in a lot and i just i, I love it. i love the bridge in the song like the entire bridge is, is just fucking great i know we've said that i've talked a lot about the bridges that they've they do but this one is no exception yeah i feel like that's definitely one of their strengths and he's gotta know like of course yeah he, he's, <laughs> he has to know uh plus like this type of music I feel like if if you know how to do it, lends itself really, really well to acoustic like versions right. of the songs. So them writing a song just like for acoustic to be played acoustically, mm-hmm. it, it just works really well. Like with the drop yeah, D it, like chords and stuff, it's just great. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a good point because like at the end of the bridge, he kind of like goes into this rocky feel, even though it is still an acoustic thing. But he he does use those kind of drop D chords, and he he has what I would imagine is like a, a typical like rocky chord progression, but it's still this on this acoustic guitar, and it just kind of gives it a bit of an edge to the song that is otherwise pretty chill, and it, it's still chill, but it's it's kind of a nice touch, I think. Yeah. Uh, lyrically, first glance, obviously, it seems to be about a ghost, which isn't very sci-fi, <laughs> but. I think that the bridge and the final verse kind of spin it. And uh, so the song's about like seeing a ghost, right? Whatever. But I, I think the bridge and the third verse maybe imply that the ghost is a metaphor for the stars where he, he's commenting on all of the stars in the sky that are, that are so far away that what we're seeing is actually what they looked like many, many, many fucking years ago. Yeah. And they're already gone. They're already dead. So what we're seeing is kind of the ghost of those stars in, in a way, because fucking space is cool, man. See, I, I think yours is probably right. The way I took it is like how memories are like ghosts of the past. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't know when it, like, if you see somebody from a memory or you're seeing it in your head or something in a way you're seeing a ghost and right. just the talking about, I don't think you're nervous enough. It happened to show its face, like talks about having a bad memory or a bittersweet memory, or I don't know, just the way the chorus ends with now point him toward rest. Right. It's it, kind of resolving that kind of conflict. Yeah. But like, like I've said probably like too many times before, <laughs> like it's probably just like the, I feel like the state of mind you're in when you listen to songs for the first time can affect it so greatly. And having for listen, sure having listened to this album with him having such like poetic and vague lyrics, I feel like definitely just lended itself to that even more than normal. Right? But yeah, that's like I got it as like an apparition of the past. He's like, cause I think it's cause I related like a, a few of the previous songs to, towards like anxiety and I was just feeling extremely nostalgic whenever I listened to this for the first time. So right. It's, it's probably why, but no, I mean, I think, I think that's very valid. I think you have a more well thought out uh, <laughs> approach to, to this thing. I just wanted to tie it into to space and, and sci-fi cause it's sci-fi crimes and I like science fiction. Well, but, the, uh, that star stuff is super cool. Like looking up the stars and you're like, that was a millions, billions years ago. <laughs> millions, billions. Yeah, for sure. It's cool as shit. And I, I think that people, a lot of people are, are enamored with the stars and space and aliens and stuff so much that maybe they see things and assume that they're aliens, even if they weren't. Like they were, I don't know, like, like sighting things in Roswell, New Mexico or something. Where you say they were like so enamored with it, they were under some sort of spell, or, or yeah, something? like 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 Ro- the spell of Roswell, like, like Ro- Roswell spell. <laughs> <laughs> and we're there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Track eight. <laughs> Roswell killed spell. it. Killed it. Absolutely nailed it. <laughs> oh my god! This yeah. One. So no, 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 okay. no, me? no, no, you, no, me, no, you. Okay. okay. So immediately, coming off of the, the, the calm acoustic song, the song just punches you right back in the face to, to kind of bring back the energy uh, 
of the rest of the album. It's it's got this like slow plodding thick riff that I think is a great way to wake people back up after kind of mellowing out in the Highlands apparition. But the pre-chorus in this is like classic Chevelle mellow kind of they they swap back and forth between that heavy plodding riff and more like subdued mellow kind of guitar playing and stuff. Got another awesome bridge in this one. Hell yeah. Lots of layers of guitars. It's 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 all great. I, I one musical note that I put at the last chorus, uh Pete, Pete gets a little bit like in in the outro, he gets a, a little bit Billy Corgan. <laughs> That's where my mind went with just the way that he was delivering the, the last lines. Where he's saying, "Does anybody really see anyone?" Yeah, it just kind of like it, it gave me Billy Corgan vibes. I I could see that. I could definitely see that. Uh, I don't know, just because. I guess it's just how I've been. I I was introspective with these songs, like I was introspective when I listened to Smashing Pumpkins or right. something. <laughs> but uh, I could definitely see it, and uh, yeah, just the the huge difference between the last song and this one mm. immediately. Just it caught me off guard. I really like this song, but just like how chuggy the opening riff, like I guess I guess it's a riff. Yeah. Oh yeah. to this one. It it was it was nice. It was a nice kind of kick in the pants. For sure. After the chillness of the last one. Uh lyrically I I don't I I feel like this song is supposed to be taken at face value just talking about the Roswell incident. But just, like, with how, I don't know, with how much I was looking into the other songs, I -hmm. looked into this one from, like, a perspective of he's using the Roswell incident to talk about, I guess, how doubt can be sown in what you see and what you do and what you say and how, I guess this is an issue with all sci-fi UFO type sighting incidents or like is there planted doubt by the government putting <laughs> right. my putting my tin 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 foil hat on is there right I don't know like it's just being able to see something that you you can't even believe yourself that you're seeing it or just the thought that your memories could be tainted by emotions that you felt at the time like I'm sure whoever saw the alleged military balloon or whatever the fuck it was supposed to be that was right. a UFO, like, they pro- they see something and they get so caught up in this new whatever that it really could have just been an, a, a, a balloon. Mm-hmm. But they don't, they can't, they can't prove that to themselves and they can't prove otherwise. I don't know. Just the distrust of your eyes, of your mind. Like, yeah. that type of thing. I, th- I think that's a pretty similar dr- conclusion that I that I drew from it, where it seems like Pete is simultaneously supporting and casting doubt on the, those stories, right? Which can be obviously applied. It could be a metaphor. It could be a shameful metaphor for <laughs> other, other things. But uh, in, in the context of it being Roswell and, and UFOs, it's like Pete believes that the witnesses really did see something or that they really believe that they saw something. Because he's like he's looking in their eyes, he's looking into their soul, and he can see that they believe it, that they actually did see something. But he's also kind of criticizing them. Uh, he he says that they're, they're like creating other needs and inventing links that maybe aren't there. So maybe maybe they believe it happened, and he he believes that they believe it happened. But that doesn't mean that everything that they're tying into it kind of kind of conspiracy theory level stuff where they're they're saying oh well it, it makes sense because of all of these other things that happened not just the sighting kind of thing where so yeah. I, I guess what, what i'm getting at is like he believes that the sighting could have been possible but the level at which people tried to fool themselves into believing it further kind of going back to the more vague what you were saying where like there, there's so much built up about it to to give substance that it, it in ways makes it less credible Yeah. than the more evidence that they're trying to tie together somehow makes it less credible kind of a thing. But the aliens are out there. People, they are, they have to be, but I believe, I believe like for real, for real. I don't know for if they're, real. I don't know if they're here, but they gotta be somewhere. 
Like, yeah. St- it's statistically unlikely that they're not yeah, somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Like they have to be somewhere. We're here, so they're yeah. somewhere. Like Exactly. <laughs> Aliens exist, sci fi's cool, deal with it. Yeah. And otherwise the track nine is called interlude and it's spelled like <laughs> lewd, like lewd material. Yeah, L E W D, which is a pun. Which is a play on words. <laughs> I don't know if that has any sort of deeper meaning because there's no lyrics uh, yeah, in this song. There's no but... lyrics. It's it's just an interlude. It's very instrumental. To me, this one it seemed like they had a riff that they really liked and yep. didn't know what to do with it, so they just kind of like threw it in as as like a a way to reset the momentum for yeah. for the album. Yeah, I definitely feel like uh, Sam Leffler and Mr. Bassist. They're just kind of, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're doodling around one day and they're like, yeah, this sounds pretty cool. I think we yeah. should put this somewhere. S- sidebar, their bassist name uh, is Dean Bernardi. Dean Bernardi. Bernardini, Bernardini, I think technically. Uh, he's no longer in the band though. Oh, well. He left, he left recently. Well. Like last year, the year before last, I think they announced that he, he was leaving. But uh, that's, that's not relevant to this discussion. <laughs> Well, I like Mr. Dean Bernardini. I like you as a bass player, and you did well on this album. So, yeah, kudos to you, Mr. Sir. <laughs> yes. Now we need to finish this album discussion off with some sort of momentum that we don't have. A new momentum, even. A new momentum <laughs> for track number 10 called A New Momentum. I think it's interesting. Uh, so maybe, yeah, I'll save it till the, until the end. Um, but yeah, A New Momentum, track 10. This one has some dissonance in it that I think is is used pretty cool. Yeah. In in a pretty cool fashion where it's not like super dissonant, but like I guess with the added distortion on the guitars makes it sound more dissonant than it really is. Um but yeah, I really like the song. This song specifically reminds me a lot of one of their other albums called This Type of Thinking Could Do Us In. Um great album. Again, I like all of their albums, but if you like this song specifically, then check out that album next. Um the drums on this one are great. I think they gave Sam a lot of space to shine on the drums in this one more so than a lot of the other ones. There's a lot of cool fills and shit that he gets to do in this one. Yeah, this this song I feel like did a good job of like staving off the album fatigue that I feel sometimes when I'm listening right. like albums in this genre. Just because, like you were talking, like that it's I don't know, like kind of dissonant. Like they got some high scratchy guitars playing around in the beginning and i mean it there there is a lot of the same elements throughout this song but it's different enough in plenty of parts to kind of keep me from being like this is too samey i i'm bored right. now I, I i'm not getting bored by this point when in in this genre or from around this time frame there's a lot of albums that were coming out that while I did really like the albums, if I tried to listen to the whole album, I would probably be getting a little bit bored by this point. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And I think that, that's what I was going to comment on that I decided to save to lean the album, but now I'm, I'm going back on it. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting that they added Interlude as track number nine, which generally an interlude would be like at a halfway point in the album, right? Yeah. But so they, they drop the interlude in, after Roswell Spell, which is the most sci-fi related, I think, song on the album, at least on face level. Uh, point being, I think this album could have ended after Roswell Spell, and that these last three songs kind of take it in a new direction, uh, which, I mean, goes with what you're saying, like, it kind of helps that a new momentum is kind of a different sound. It's still the same Chevelle sound, but they take it in a different direction than a lot of the rest of this album and it, it kind of makes me feel like it maybe wasn't originally intended to be on this album or yeah. maybe that it the album as an album probably would have worked better in my opinion if it stopped at track eight i'm going to preemptively agree with you but i'll give my reasoning in the next song Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, this song lyrically uh, a new momentum seemed kind of like a jab at complacency yeah. Where he, he it seems like he's talking about how people are content to just watch the world go to shit and not try to do anything until it's far too late to do anything about it. And they're like, oh shit, we need to act, but it's 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 too late. Yeah. Fucked up. Like this to me it speaks to something that we were talking about in our uh 
I guess, tangent earlier <laughs> yeah. about like finding your purpose in life and or just not ha- feeling like you have one or something. Mm-hmm. And so many people, it's so easy to fall into that trap. And this is about like trying to get you to find that new momentum to get you out of that or to get you away from just the steady march forward that makes somebody else a ton of money, I guess. I like that. I I, I like that. And I think it fits better on this album than what I had said. (laughs) I'm going to take that as my answer. (laughs) Woo. (laughs) Well, you know what? Let's, uh, let's end this circus then, I guess on circus has been going on for far too long. (laughs) Or maybe just right. Track number eleven. This circus. Is this circus. Uh, oh. I feel like the the verses in this one are pretty weak, uh, musically to me. But I think the other sections in the song make up for it. Uh, it still keeps the aesthetic of the album, and I really like the chorus in this one. The chorus is fucking yeah. sick. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it kind of the the this at this point, I was kind of experiencing that kind of album fatigue that you mentioned in the last one. Yeah, I wouldn't say this song's underwhelming because I, I agree with you. I really do like the chorus. But mm-hmm. yeah, the verses left something to be desired. And while this is a fine ending to the album, it's not like the finale that yeah. I feel like had it ended on on track eight, I feel like Roswell's spell would have been a better finale to the to the album. But well, I'm, I'm glad we're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> we, this is like the first discussion that we've had in a while. I think that we are just like consistently on on the same page at like every turn. Pretty sweet, man. Which I'm, I'm excited about. Uh, lyrically, though, before we kind of wrap up, uh, this one I wasn't really sure what this track was about, but what I gleaned from it was that it seemed that he was finally accepting his part in the circus of the entertainment industry or maybe society in general, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about him being on tour and feeling exhausted at the beginning of the album where he's kind of like accepting his role as a musician where he's giving the people what they need, even though he, he can see the, the bigger picture and he sees bigger things unfolding. He's putting on this act for the world to see because it's what the people need to keep living. It's what society needs is to, to, is that kind of entertainment to keep them out of the, the boring bits of their life. Uh, even if it's a distraction from bigger issues. Yeah, I definitely got, I guess a pretty similar take on the song, like relating it to a new momentum, talking about that steady march forward in the, in the name of profit for somebody else like talking about society as a whole, like he is talking about his part in that circus or the the listener's part in that circus, talking about just how it's, I don't know, just the take on it all as a circus, I guess. But yeah. I feel like it would work more in the entertainment industry. Talk Like, I don't know. I feel like you're probably right about like, relating back to sleep apnea about it just being about he probably did just write it whenever he was on tour and was just like this is my experience as a person who who works in this industry right and that i feel like that is probably more how he wrote the songs and then anybody can just take whatever meaning they feel like but given that start up to the album i feel like this is probably where it ends in the entertainment industry as him with part of as him being part of that circus agree well we finally made it We're, this is one of the longer episodes we've done i think at this point uh maybe not the longest but uh, I'm, not, I'm not sorry for it I'm, I'm glad that we had we had some technical difficulties which hopefully you guys couldn't notice hopefully uh, i freaked to, out for a second <laughs> due to my supreme editing skills hopefully you guys don't notice it's 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 we, we had a pretty clean cut fortunately with the technical yeah. difficulties but uh next week what are what are we listening to this week and talking about next week, Joey? Okay, I unintentionally picked another EP for next <laughs> week. Uh, so the artist is Ray Brown, and the the EP album, I guess you could call it, is called <laughs> the collection of songs. Yeah, is uh, Lovers One or Lovers I, if you're t- speaking in Roman <laughs> numerals, I guess. Do, but, do you speak in Roman numerals by pronouncing I? I, do you say like I I I if you're talking three or do you just say three? 
you know, I I think you would say whatever the Roman language equivalent of three is. I don't know what that is. It's I I I I I I I Captain. Maybe that's I, Captain. Yeah, Ray Brown lovers yeah, yeah. Uh, for clarification for those trying to search it. It's R E I for Ray yeah. instead of R A Y. Yeah, which is what I would, my my American brain tells me is how Ray is spelled. But uh, yeah, do you, you got any any context for this, or are we just going in blind? Um. I mean, he was featured on Nectar, which was the Joji album okay. that I put in my top five. So yeah. that's kind of what I I had heard of him way before this, and I was actually extremely excited whenever I saw that he was featured on that album. But ta- talking about it kind of got me back into it, and I saw that I had put it on the list a long time ago of albums for us to do. And I was like, you know what? I'm kind of feeling this after the way I've been feeling for the past two weeks. I feel like this could be a good bridge hell yeah album so you know. <laughs> a bridge album to god knows what we're gonna do next i mean i have an idea of what we're gonna do next and you do too but the listeners don't they don't so. i'm excited i'm i'm excited yeah. i'm almost more excited for the album that i know you're <laughs> gonna one one step at a time yeah, yeah one step yeah. at a time we're doing ray brown lovers one the the first half there are two eps that are lovers right there's levels lovers one and lovers two right yeah both are good albums so if you're gonna listen cool. to one listen to the other R- lovers one is only like 16 minutes long so why not i mean if you want to discuss we can do both back to back as a full episode how long is lovers two i don't even know i if i knew i would give you an answer right now but okay. i don't know well t- tentatively we're just going to discuss lovers one we might decide to do lovers two uh, we don't want to bore you guys with listening to us bicker about why we should or shouldn't. Yeah. But uh, keep an eye on our social media, and we'll maybe update you. Probably not. You'll just be surprised when we release the the update saying, hey, this episode's out now. We talked about this album. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can follow us there. Uh, or if you're just riveted and just really want to know, you can just message us or leave a comment somewhere, and we'll tell you. I just directly. looked it up. By the way, let's listen to both of them. Okay, you heard it here from folks. We're listening to both EPs, Back to Back, Lovers 1 and 2, the collection of lovers, the saga of, of lovers. Uh, but until then, uh, thank you guys for listening. Give, give, everyone give Joey good vibes for, the, for getting out of the slump that he's in. And, and everyone, if you're in a slump, I'm giving you my good vibes because you can get, you can get through this shit. We'll get I, through it all. Hell yeah. Music okay. helps. <laughs> I don't have that many good vibes just ever, generally. But no. But right now you're at a low. <laughs> yeah. No, know that all of them are going towards other people. So I rely strictly <laughs> on good vibes from other people. I need good vi- good vibes transplants constantly. Well, so so everyone just, just throw all of your, your vibes this way. I'll throw all mine your way and, and it'll be some sort of weird feedback loop that I hope you guys stay in. Yeah.